Hey Siri, it's model building time. Got it. Hello everybody and welcome to Fat Guy Productions. I am Paul, coming to you as always from beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. Hello. In today's video, we are just doing a very simple Sweet 16 Hot Wheels restoration, but it's going to look substantially different because we're throwing back the curtain to give you a look behind the scenes. So, let's get to work. Each day of creating and filming begins the same way. I head on up to my work zone, turn on all the lights, and then I go ahead and set up my laptop. My laptop connects to everything through a dock, and I'll show you more about that in just a minute. Using my MacBook Pro and this one simple little cord, I can control just about 90% of my environment. Of course, in addition to my recordings, I can also listen to music or watch movies or whatever entertainment I feel like I want while I'm working. Invariably, my work area is a mess. So I usually come upstairs and after the lights are on and the computer is connected, I'll open up any packages I might have and then I'll clean up my mess so I can start my day fresh. Here I receive some new wheels for a project you're going to be seeing soon and it's one that I can't wait to get to. With everything in its place and everything cleaned up, I can head on over to my stash. I know today, for this video, I want a very simple restoration, and I'm thinking hot heat. I haven't done one before, and it seems like a lot of fun. I have two or three of them, and this one's looking like a pretty good candidate. It's missing its windshield and interior, but I already have replacement parts for it, so this may be the one. This second one, eh, it's too much. With my work area cleaned up, my car in hand, I think I'm ready to go ahead and start filming. So I'll turn around, make sure I have the right camera selected, and start to record. I begin as always by just giving you a look at the car in its existing state so you know what I have to work with. I'll be mixing in some behind the scenes narrative along with the normal scripting I would do for this build. So it'll be kind of a little bit of a hodgepodge, but it should give you a really good look at how things happen here. You might think to look at it from all the Hobby Zone stuff that I'm organized. Well, I'm far from it, as you can see, as I try and find the right bits I want to take the car apart. I've got a little cubby filled with drill bits and taps and all this other stuff. And sometimes it's a headache to find just the right thing.
I really do love using my shielded drilling technique, but as good as it works, even it fails sometimes. It didn't work great on this casting. I begin as always by getting the car apart. This one is held together only by one post, so you'd think it'd be a snap to drill out, but no, not so. After a lot of work and a pretty Herculean fight, I finally get this car apart. Once apart, I find I don't have a ton of pieces, especially since this casting is missing both the interior and the windshield. But, as I mentioned, I needn't worry, I already have reproduction parts for it. The motor just kind of friction fits into the body, and it's really not in bad shape. I'm going to hit it up with some Molotow Chrome and see how that's going to look, but for now I'll just put it aside. The body is actually pretty solid, and so is the base, although these wheels are done in. Honestly, I shouldn't have drilled out the post and tapped it here. Uh, that would have been a more true-to-life look behind the scenes with me screwing something up, but actually I remembered it and did it. So, applause please. Thank you. You can see that even though I picked up to start the project for the day, my work area gets really messy really fast. Sometimes it's unbearable. The videos you see day in and day out don't really tell the whole story. Content providers are constantly striving to keep the time down and to keep videos fresh, so they're not always showing the same old boring routines. While you may only see 30 to 90 seconds of footage covering the process of taking the car apart, drilling and tapping the posts, it can take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, especially if you have a stubborn car. I start and stop the camera often, as I don't want these giant, long, 30-minute clips that I have to edit through. So, I stopped the camera when I started to do some cleanup, and now I'm going to restart it as we're going to turn to the warm liquid goo phase of this process. I love this part. This is my favorite part, is watching these cars just sink down into the goo. Bloop! And it goes, and down into the depths it is sucked. You'll notice it's really quiet in my room while I'm working. Other than the cuckoo clock, there really isn't any noise except the noise of me doing the project. I'm not playing any movies or vinyl on my turntable. I'm not talking. And that's because I like to give you the natural sounds as sort of a background noise. And then I do my voiceovers later. If you could hear music or a movie in the background, I can get a copyright strike, and it's just a headache I don't want.
So I've stopped filming while the car is in the goo and I'm looking at the base and trying to figure out what I want to do next. I'm seeing an issue here. The base has a little painted spot in the front grill. I need to get that out of there because it's all chipped and ugly looking and I'll repaint it later. I'm going to go ahead and get everything ready for this before I start the camera. I get out a little work surface so I can get some stripper out and not make a mess on my work mat. I'm going to find a brush and then I'll get out the jar of warm liquid goo. With everything at the ready, I'll turn around and go ahead and start the camera again. And now I can go ahead and just brush on a little bit of the goo on the front grill to get rid of that black paint. And here's how the voiceover of this segment would sound. The grill has a small bit of black paint on it, so with a brush, I dab a bit of citrus strip on it, and then I set it aside as well. Since I'm at a bit of an impasse here while I wait for the citrus strip, I'm going to go ahead and dig out the other parts I'll need for this build. I need the interior and the windshield. I first looked in the box where I keep all the interiors, and it's not in there, which kind of puzzled me. And then I remembered that it was packaged together when I bought it, along with the glass. So I put it all together in one container into the bucket I keep all the glass pieces in. I do have labels on all of the drawers and containers, and even for areas where I have storage underneath my desk, I have small labels on the work surface that tell me where stuff is. It makes it a lot easier because, frankly, I'm kind of flighty sometimes. The reproduction pieces look really nice, so I think I'm all set. I can just set those aside and wait for the stripper to finish. So I'm just trying now to find things to keep myself busy while the paint stripper is doing its job. So I think I'm going to go ahead and put some Molotow on the motor. For that, I need a little alligator clip and a stand that I have over on the painting side of my room. So I'll take a spin over there and go get my little set. It's from Hobby Zone, and I'll put a link to it below. It really is useful. I really use these things a lot, so I actually have two of them. It comes with all these little alligator clips on these wires and this little container that has holes that will hold the wires. The lid is magnetic and pops off and there's a bunch of these wires and other pieces inside. I keep some adhesive and some other kinds of clips in there. I love these things. Highly, highly recommended. In fact, I should do a tip of the month on these. I have a brush here just in case, but I always prefer to put the Molotow on using the pen itself. This allows me to put it on really thick and smooth. That allows the Molotow to shine its best. And a part of my day is every six days I have to wind my cuckoo clock. 
I got this in one of my last trips to Germany in Rothenburg, an amazing city. Love it. Cuckoo. Cuckoo. Okay, so while the paint is stripping off of the body, I'm going to take this opportunity to kind of give you a rundown on my setup here for doing the videos, okay? And we're going to start with my, uh, the, the workhorse right here. This is my uh, MacBook Pro, and I've done a review on that. And months into this new uh, laptop, I can still safely say it is awesome, and I highly recommend it. Anyhow, what I do is I bring the laptop in here and I put it into this stand and with this one cable, it is connected to this dock here. That dock connects to desktop speakers, the monitor over here, all of the cameras, the mic, the mixer, everything goes through that dock into the laptop. As soon as I plug the laptop in, the monitor essentially becomes my computer. I'm using this wireless mouse and wireless keypad, and I have basically turned this into that. So it's just, you know, really convenient for me. So what happens is, as I'm filming, it is now all dumping straight into my laptop. Uh, in the past, I was doing most of my videos right here on the iPhone, like you're seeing now, and it really became difficult to get the longer videos and clips out of the phone and over into my laptop where I could work on them because of uh, the, you know, the Wi-Fi transfers and all that stuff. And this works much better because all the footage is right there in the computer as soon as it's recorded. So this is really a great setup. Now, I can use this Logi Capture uh, software and I can control both cameras here. I can go from one to two, and I can go to a, a, a picture in a picture or a split screen or, or whatever you, you want to do here. So I have a lot of control over there, and I click record. And then what's happening is everything's going through the Mac, but it's dumping into this eight terabyte external hard drive. So I have plenty of space to keep my videos. So... That's how that's happening over there. Now we'll take a look over here at the desk and the cameras and lighting and stuff. Okay, so over here at the desk, of course we have my, my work area, my work mat, and all my hobby zone stuff and all my supplies. But I also have to have essentially a studio over here. So it's not enough to have a work area, I've gotta have a studio. So um, right up there I have a giant key light. And um, that is my main light source for lighting the videos, all right? Then uh, you've seen the review on my light here, and that is for lighting my work area. Plus, I have a bunch of other lights around to uh, help reduce glare, things like that. Now, right here is uh, the newest thing that I've done, and this has been in the last month or so. I have switched and I'm using my Canon M50 as my primary camera here. So all the videos like uh, the Turning Type 2s where you, I'm a talking head, those are all being recorded through the Canon M50, all the intros, the exits, things like that. And on the front of the camera is a teleprompter. I do start, uh, you know, I recently I've started scripting my videos. This one is not. But I have started scripting my videos, and while I'm not locked into those scripts, it really helps keep me uh, focused and pointed in the right direction. So I've got my teleprompter on the front of my M50, and yes, that wires directly over into the hub. So when I film, it feeds straight into the computer. Right here, I have a Logitech uh, camera, um, a 920. And that is my top-down camera, so it's, it's filming straight down at my little work zone here. Yes, it's a little bit in the way, but I can move over here if I need a little more room. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's nothing terrible. And then over here, I don't know if you can see it real well, I have another 920. And that is giving me a little bit of a side view and a second angle. All right, so the paint on the grill has come loose. So we can take that here, take this brush, wash that all off. Get rid of all that extra stripper. Move the brush. 
polish off. And, and there you have it. So, we can take this back. And that part's done and just wait for the body. So, I'm not filming anything right now. I'm just, uh, I'm back from the sink, and I can take advantage of the time here, clean off that brush. I can actually take and wipe off the uh, chassis of the car, dry it off. And before I actually do any uh, real work on the body, like, it looks like all this is going to need is some wire wheeling and some polishing. So, um, before I get into any of that, I will activate the camera again. But for right now, I'm just kind of checking things out. There's a little bit of toning down here. This probably could use a trip through at least the line away. So that's probably what I'm gonna try first. Uh, but while I'm off camera, I'm just gonna pick at this grill a little bit and see if uh, some of that can come off. This is such light toning that I'm going, before I commit to having to go to electro polishing and electro plating, I'm just gonna try some line away. Here's my mixture of lime away and water. It's about a 50-50 ratio. It really works well for lightly, lightly tarnished vehicles. Anything stronger than that, I'll have to go down and electro polish and add some zinc plating to it. Once this base is looking the way I want it, I'll pluck it out of the Lime Away mixture and give it a quick rinse, and then I can hit it up with my brass bristle brush. Between the Lime Away bath and the brass bristle brush, this base really cleaned up nicely. As long as I'm fiddling around with the base, I might as well cut the old wheels off now. So I'm going to use my trusty Tamiya sprue cutters, and I'm just going to clip each wheel so that it comes apart especially because these hubs are very loose and a little questionable. I don't want to damage them. With the base all cleaned up and the dirty old wheels gone, I'll go ahead and protect the base further by applying a coat of Renaissance wax to prevent any further tarnish. Now I can pull the body from the goo. The citrus strip does exceptionally well on Spectra Flame paint jobs, and in relatively short order, the paint on the body was slurming right off. The body, just like the base, will get a quick wash at the sink and a once over with my brush and some steel wool. I'm hoping that this behind the scenes look gives you a better concept 
of what us content creators go through to make even just a 20 minute video. You see 20 minutes of a craft or a hobby or a how-to or a review. You don't ever really think about what goes into making these videos. So when we ask you to please click subscribe and give it a thumbs up and make a comment and all of those things, you can understand why. It doesn't cost you anything to subscribe, but it can mean the world of difference to a content provider who's trying to make his channel into something special. So when we ask you to please give it a thumbs up and click subscribe, please take that hundredth of a second and click the subscribe button. The casting looks like it could benefit from a short bath in the CLR as well, so we'll go ahead and drop it in. It's super important not to leave the casting in the liquid too long as it will speed right past clean and into headache. After I pull the casting from the lime away and give it a rinse, then I can really get busy on it with a little bit of 4-0 steel wool. This body has lots of little nooks and crannies. It's not easy to shine it up, but it's going to pay dividends later on. While I'm shining the casting up with the steel wool, I'm also looking at the body very carefully for any trouble spots, toning, dings, dents, anything that might deter from the final look. Once the casting is nice and shiny, I can go ahead and head over to my paint booth. So now is as good a time as any to talk to you about how uh, things go over here at the paint side. Um, I did upgrade the paint side with the new booth that you've seen. And uh, I also added in a dedicated camera for filming over here, which is this GoPro. And it's been working pretty good so far. But I think I can do better. And I'm really toying around with the idea of um, bringing one of those Logitechs over here. So uh, I don't really know yet how this is going to go. But so far, this is what I'm doing over here. And uh, I've been pretty happy with it. Got my little paper towel. This roll is bent to the end, so I have to help feed it out. Okay. And uh, I really don't have any idea of what color. I'm going to paint this yet. Okay, so it's down to one of the two blues, the antifreeze or the magenta. I'm going to look at the body. The problem with the antifreeze is it shows every little ding and dink, although this body is really actually pretty good.
Should I stop being a chicken butt and go with antifreeze? Yeah. That's what I should do. I should get rid of my phobia vis-a-vis -vis vis -vis, uh, antifreeze paint. The, the thing is, antifreeze paint can be really difficult to put down well. Um, so, hey, behind the scenes video, what? Let's show how things work. Is yeah, sometimes things work out great. Sometimes things don't. We're gonna find out. So anyhow, like I said, I do have a dedicated camera here and uh, I'm gonna actually turn it on now. All right, you won't be able to hear me. So I've decided to go with Spectraflame Antifreeze, a notoriously hard paint to make look good. I figured if I'm going to blow this build, I might as well do it in big time fashion for you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and give this a whirl and see how it comes out. The thing about the Spectraflame antifreeze is that it shows every flaw. If there's a ding or a dent or any toning whatsoever, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb. So that's why I said earlier that the prep work on the body is going to pay dividends later on. Hopefully, I did enough work here that this will come out looking great. I told you up front that I was afraid of antifreeze. It's a hard paint to put down. It's never been more important than to apply it properly in light, easy passes. Here I am doing my tack coat, and then I'm following it up with some medium coats. And yes, I do put on a heavy coat, but I'm very, very careful about it so it doesn't start to pool in the corners. With the antifreeze paint dry, I can go ahead and put on some clear coat. A lot of guys skip this because they're looking for a more realistic, natural finish. For me, you know, I'm addicted to the clear coat. I love the way it looks.
COVID-19 be damned. This is what masks are for. Protecting your lungs while you're doing your painting. Highly recommended. Please wear your protective equipment. Just to be really, really clear about this, original Hot Wheels did not have this deep, glossy shine to them. They had beautiful paint jobs, no mistaking, but they weren't covered in this deep, rich, glossy, clear coat. But I put it on my restorations because I just love the way it looks. I guess you could, in that sense, equate it to the way I use the chrome deep dish wheels all the time. It may not be correct, but I can't help myself because I love the way they look. I left this footage in just so you can see all of the extra stuff that goes around with the paint jobs and everything else. Every time I bust out my airbrush, I have to clean it. That takes time. You never get to see this in the finished videos, but every layer of paint, every layer of clear coat, I have to go through this rigorous cleaning process, and even that's not enough. Every now and then, about once monthly, I have to tear the airbrush completely down and do a thorough cleaning. With the car painted, I can now turn to the reassembly. First, I'm going to pull out a nice set of reproduction wheels. I've mentioned it before, you know I love the chrome deep dish red lines, and they're going to look really amazing on this model. I press the new wheels on lightly, then I back up the hub with my alignment tool to press them on the rest of the way equally and to protect the delicate axles. Once the wheels are on, I can make any needed adjustments to the wheel alignment.
The reproduction windshield looked great already, but it could always benefit from a dip in the gauzy. So I give it a dip, wick away the excess, and put it in the onion saver to dry. Again, these videos can be very sanitized. Right here, it looks like I'm doing just fine, dipping the windshield in the gauzy and getting it into the onion saver. That was the fourth time I did it. The first three times, I dropped it every single time. Each time, I had to go back, re-dip it, and try it again. I ended up deciding to go with a reproduction motor, which just sort of pops in. After that, I can attach the base back onto the body using a single button head screw. I know this seems completely out of order, but it seems to be the way it goes together. The model didn't come with an interior or windshield, so I didn't get to see how they were installed. I'm just going to have to kind of figure it out. The reproduction parts don't seem to have any way to lock or trap them in. It seems like it's more of a friction fit. The gauzy is dried, and all that's left is to put the windshield and interior in. I first seat the windshield in its place, and it's clear that the glass will be held in by the interior. But there doesn't seem to be a definitive way to lock the interior down, so I just apply a drop of thick CA glue to the support tab under the interior and set it into place. With the car assembled, all that's left is a bit of detail paint. I'll paint in the grill with a bit of flat black, and then we can call this one done. Depending on the build, the level of detail painting can take a long, long time. For this build, it's going to be fairly simple as all I have to do is paint in the grill. Okay, right about here is where I would normally be wrapping up my videos. I would show you the close-up glamour shots and all of that fun stuff, but the work has just begun for us. Now, we have to begin the editing process. And I always begin with just a simple initial edit. I go into my files, and I gather together all the video clips, and I dump them into my program. I happen to use iMovie. I think it's great for these simple videos. And then I start to cut the clips down and arrange them into a rough order that I kind of like.
every second of footage has to be reviewed to get rid of all of the dud footage and to make sure we don't miss anything spectacular. Everything needs to be arranged into a cohesive order and we have to be cognizant of our running time of the final project. Depending on the content provider's personal preferences, we also have to be aware of our audio. In my case, I like to use natural ambient audio, but I dial it back so that the voiceovers are prominent. Remember, this initial edit is only the first pass. Later, after scripting and voiceovers, I'll have to come back and fine-tune everything. I'm just trimming things down and getting them in order to make it workable. Now that I have preliminary editing done, I can go ahead and use what I have to help me write a script for the voiceovers. I didn't used to use a script, but I found it made it very difficult for me to stay organized and cohesive. By using a script, I can keep my thoughts organized and stay on target. During the voiceovers I find that the script is more of a, a guideline than a rock-solid you must say this type of thing and I think it gives the finished product a better result. In the intros and exits however I do pretty much stick to the script. The scripting begins with research. I turn to the internet and I look up the subject at hand and gather together any facts that I want to use in the final script. Once the research is done, I open up my word processor and begin typing out the lines. I write the teaser, the introduction, then I use the facts I gathered in my research, then I turn to the preliminary edit of the video and start writing text to go along with the footage. Once I've scripted out everything I want to say, I wrap it up by writing how I want to close the video. Again, this is just more of an outline to help keep me on target. A lot of freelancing gets done when I'm doing these things. Quite often, I have to go back and add to the script, as I find a lot of holes that need filling.
Hey gang, and welcome to Fat Guy Productions. It's Paul coming to you as always from beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. And today we're going to be restoring a very fun Sweet 16 Hot Wheels Hot Heap. It's going to be a lot of fun. The Hot Heap was one of the original Sweet 16 cars released in 1968. It's a very loved car. Everybody enjoyed it. And it was modeled after a real car, the King T, which was a modified Model T. It's going to be fun. This car needs my help. So let's get right to it. With the preliminary video and a script in hand, I can now go ahead and start doing my voiceovers, sort of like I'm doing right here. I'm watching the video as it scrolls by, and I'm talking along with the video, using my script as a guideline. And I already mentioned how a lot of freelancing happens, and this is a perfect example of that. Because everything I'm saying right now wasn't scripted. Once the voiceovers are done, I go ahead and film the talking head portion of the video with my teaser and introduction and my closing. That's where I do use the teleprompter and I stick pretty strictly to the script. Here's a look at that process and how it'll come out. Each day of crafting and uh, Hey gang and welcome to Fat Guy Productions. I'm Paul coming to you as always from beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. And today we're going to be restoring a very fun Sweet 16 Hot Wheels Hot Heap. The Hot Heap is one of the original 16 castings, which was released in 1968 and was a favorite of the series. It was based on the real-life show car King T, a modified Model T Roadster. It's going to be fun. This car needs my help, so let's get right to it. Once I've got the voiceovers and the intros and exits recorded, I can go back to the video editing software and do the final edit. This is where I'll put it all together and fine tune everything and make it pretty much the way you're going to see it. Oh, but we're not done yet. This might seem like the end, but it is not over yet. Next, I have to take glamour shots. A lot of guys like to use the rotisserie. I did it for a while. I decided it didn't show the car well enough. It was too much movement. I really just didn't like it. So I have turned to a series of glamour shots that I share at the end of my video. I set up my display. I position the car. I adjust the lights, and yes, I just use my iPhone camera to take the pictures. Yes, I guess you could call it a cheat in the fact that I do pose the car in a manner to try and show off its best look. Here you can see the pictures that I'm taking. So, is this the last step? No, not by a long shot. We still have a lot more work to do.
as these are glamour shots, they need to look their best. So I go through all the pictures I took, and I pick out only the very best shots, and I drag them into Adobe Lightroom. Here I'm going to be able to do a little bit of editing to make the pictures really look special. After the batch of pictures is imported into Lightroom, I can start the editing process. I can check the exposure and make sure it's where I like it. I can open up the shadows and tone down the highlights. I can set the white points. I can set the black points. Down here, I'm going to increase the sharpness. Increasing sharpness can bring in some noise, so I'm going to reduce the noise. I'm going to adjust for the camera. And a little trick I like is to put a little vignetting in. This really draws your eye to the car. Finally, I like to give the car a little bit of a highlight. Something subtle that you don't really notice, but your brain says, Boy, that picture looks nice. Fortunately, Lightroom makes it very easy to apply these settings to the entire batch with one simple click. After that, I just take a quick look at them and make sure there's nothing I need to tweak on the individual photos, and then I can export them to my desktop. Let's take a look at the original photo and then the edited. Here's the original photo. Here's the edited photo. It's hard for your brain to determine why, but you do know that it's better. Once the pictures are edited, I can drag them over into iMovie, put them in their place, and now I can upload to YouTube. No, 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 we are still not done. Once the upload is completed, now we have to go and edit things on YouTube. Now, I really haven't uploaded it yet, so we're just going to use a previous video to give you an idea of what's involved. I open the video. I have to make sure that the video's title is correct. It's very descriptive. Then I have to add to the description. This is where I describe what's in the video and put all my links. As you can see, there's a lot to put in there. I have to make sure that the thumbnail is correct, which means more time in Photoshop, creating the thumbnail and then uploading it, and I have to put in all my tags. But now we can finally see the finished product of this build and the finished video. Yes, we're finally at the end of the road. Well, there you have it, my hot heap. It came out great, and I just love the way the chrome deep dish wheels look on it. It really just works. Love this thing. I hope you liked this video, and I hope you liked the look behind the curtain, the behind the scenes thing. If you did, please give this video a giant thumbs up, click subscribe, 
and click the bell to be notified anytime I release a new video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. I read everything. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. Until next time, this is Paul from Fat Guy Productions wishing you a splendiferous day filled with fun and new things and a lot of success in anything you try. Until next time, be good.